So first, first of all, um, thank you both. Um, and just a brief word of introduction. Um, Yankel Krakowski is a puppeteer, playwright, actor, director, educator, and Yiddishist based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and Miriam Udell is the Associate Professor of German Studies, Judith London Evans, Director of the TAM Institute of Jewish Studies at Emory University, where she focuses on teaching Yiddish language, literature, and culture. So thank you both again for, for being with us tonight and for sharing this wonderful film with us. Um, I wonder if we could start by you telling us a little bit about how did this project come about? Want to start that, Jake? <laughs> yeah, sure. Happily. Um, we're laughing because we told some version of this story uh, a, a few times, but it's one that I like to tell. Um, so uh, Miriam and I, I guess, sort of coincidentally met each other some years ago in relation to a, a different project that I had done um, and uh, had me come and, and do a reading of a play I'd written a few times for a class. Um, but we, we really reconnected, I think it was like winter 2019 maybe, mm -hmm. um, when in anticipation of the publication of Honey on the Page, Miriam was teaching um, a seminar on Yiddish children's literature and shot me a little email to the tune of, hey, I think you might get a kick out of this. <laughs> and, um, and I attended and immediately my mind was blown open and I was, um, like enraptured with this entire world that I had no familiarity even existed. Um, and one of the stories that you had us read was, uh, I think, one or maybe even two selections from uh, Lobzik, which was, it's originally a book of 12 stories, released in 1935 by Chaver Paver. And uh, Miriam said to me, I can see that you're really digging <laughs> these communist Yiddish puppy dog stories. <laughs> don't you think they would make a great puppet show? Um, and I was a puppy show, yes, thank you. Uh, and I was like kind of, I was like, yes, of course, of course they would. But like to my sort of embarrassment, I kind of cynically was like, who in the world is going to produce this unbelievably niche topical project? Um, Less niche than you uh, turns would out. find out, yeah. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> And a couple, a couple sessions later, um, we, were, we were continuing to talk about it, and I had continued to fall more and more in love with this stuff. And we were walking back to our cars one day, and Miriam said to me, you know, if you really like this stuff and you think you might be interested in, in learning more or in working with it, you really ought to go and learn Yiddish. If you want to engage with this material, you ought to be able to engage with it in the original text. And I sort of hemmed and hawed um, oh, I'm a little too old for these summer programs, and I don't, you know, I'm not very good at learning languages, and, and, and this and that, and dos and yins. And uh, Miriam said something to me that I will like remember for the whole rest of my life, because I, like probably most of us in this room, really only want one thing, which is for my teachers to be proud of me. Um, and she said, like, look, I'm not saying that you should do this for my sake, and I'm not even really doing saying you should do this for your sake. Um, I'm saying that you ought to do this because I have a feeling that you have something to contribute. And I was like, well, all right, well, what am I going to do in that case? <laughs> I think I went home and started the application that very night, spent a summer learning Yiddish, then we and got then, back in touch. <laughs> yeah, then, then you got in touch with me, and by now we were all deep in pandemic. This was summer, this was fall of 2020, and you said... Theater Emory is looking for projects that can be produced in pandemic conditions and streamed. Could we think again about those Lobzik stories? Where are you with your translation? And I translated the Lobzik stories as a translation fellow at the Yiddish Book Center for 2019, and I was kind of crafting it out and taking my time and hadn't quite finished. I had uh, some things I wanted to tweak um, by this point in 2020, and the pandemic was an excuse, and I was working on other things. And you said, I think Theater Emory will do this. Can you hurry up and finish? <laughs> so I did. We really sort of... Part of, part of the idea in the moment was like, you know, these institutions, they really don't, no, nobody knows what to do with this moment. 
I think a pitch might be, you know, a better received than under sort of random circumstances up against all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And we were able to kind of develop a concept of something that would be possible under the very strict limitations of what we could do at the time, um, which is part of why this, well, it's everything about why this looks the way it does. Like so many projects, it's defi it was defined a lot by its limitations, which ended up being part of the, the joy of it was finding, okay, well, what style? Because in a different world, we cast, I don't know, 10 Emory University undergrads and I coached them in puppetry and we did it like hand in mouth, like Muppet style. You know, there's a million ways. Initially, we had no particular concept for, for the style, but one of the reasons why it ended up the way it did in this sort of paper puppetry toy theater context is that it was just physically possible to be performed b by me. Uh, because I, it turns out I wasn't allowed to have anyone else in the studio when we were filming. Um, we had other aesthetic considerations, you know, we were really interested in a sort of like pop-up book kind of, like the, you know, the, the illustrations are such a beautiful part of the original, the illustrations by Lou Bunin. Um, and so the idea that it could be a little bit like these beautiful ink illustrations come to life also sort of encouraged us in the direction of the paper thing. But some of it was just you know, sheer necessity of like, what can one person with two hands, which is, you know, if you notice moments where say like everybody, and there's a few different characters walking and they're all sort of moving like perfectly simultaneously, it's because I only have uh, two hands. This is the chagrin of every puppeteer, um, but it, it is unavoidable. And uh, yeah, that was partially attempt to try and make these limitations work for us. Well, you did a lot with those two hands. Um, so you spoke about the, how the political dimension of these stories was one of the things that really drew you in. And Miriam, you do, I know you've written about um, how relevant these stories are for children today. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that, about the Lobzik stories and about um, this kind of repertoire that you've you know, translated and, and written so much about. Sure, so broadly, children's literature is a project of the secular left and there are ideological streams that range from Yiddishism, just wanting to further and propagate Jewish culture in Yiddish, to Bundism, socialism, communism, labor Zionism. And these particular stories grow out of the most communist aligned of the Yiddish educational movements, the International Workers' Order. And um, they had a strong sense in the 30s that the number one crisis was economic inequality, particularly during the Depression, but that there were all of these other simultaneous crises that had to be redressed, that police brutality and a lack of ethical behavior in policing that you could see thematized in the Lobzik and the Mayer story was a problem, that racism had to be dismantled. In fact, the only chapter in the book where Lobzik doesn't get to be the hero and where Lobzik doesn't get to be so clever is when Lobzik bites Nayach, the member of the pioneers who is black, um, Lobzik bites him for no good reason and has to be socially ostracized and learn his lesson that you can't bite somebody because of the color of their skin. And Lobzik really takes that to heart. And indeed, the Lobzik and the pioneers is the very next story after that. Um, so there were all of these social issues, and then there were also circumstances like the airborne pandemic that um, threatens Rivka's life in the in the story Labzig and the Doctor, um, and all of these just felt so relevant and immediate, and we wanted to bring all of that to life. A part of my interest as well in the in the politics of these stories is like, yeah, Javier Pavar was um, was associated with the Communist Party, and like we, you know, we still very much live in a um, sort of post McCarthyist uh, idiom where people hear the word communist and they totally lose their mind and associate it exclusively like with the greatest crimes, you know, that they can remember from history. Um, but the values the, that are on display in these stories are like 201, not only relevant, but like very endorsable. Like I, I think it's, it's if, if, in fact, we have had genuine children uh, watch and enjoy these stories. And I think, you know, a lot of it is, um, 
imminently relevant to us. And, you know, the stories that we picked, we picked, I think, for two main reasons because they seemed like they would be most suited for a sort of cinematic treatment in the visual medium that is puppetry, and also because they're the most thematically still relevant. And the ones that we didn't include, um, some of which I would still love to adapt, and some of them, it's not because the values were things that we disagreed with, but, but because they were just really relics of their moment. You know, there's... There's one that has to do with the family's uh, portrait of linen that they have on the wall. And okay, so that's maybe not quite as relevant to our immediate The big moment. bad boy scout comes and tears it down. Yes. <laughs> big bad bourgeois boy scout. Right. Um, but overall, it's incredibly relevant and has a lot to teach us still. Free sandwiches, hard to argue with. Um, You'd be surprised. <laughs> I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the Yiddish. Um, you know, the choice to have these three layers. You have the kind of meta narrator who speaks with a Yiddish accent. Um, you have the narrate. The narration is in English, and you have dialogue in Yiddish. So, can you speak a little bit about that choice? And also, while on the topic of Yiddish, um, the Yiddish actors and the dialect choices. If if there was any thought behind that. Well, one one facet of it is that I was a, well, I kind of still am, I suppose, but I was like truly a little baby Yiddishist, brand new Yiddish speaker learning actively to speak the language when we made this. And part of it was just I was in the midst of falling in love with this language and everything associated with it and wanted to make sure that was sort of front and center. Um, another thing that, yeah. And so that's from one side, that's from the Yiddish side. And then on the English side, it was really important both pedagogically, educationally, and in terms of the funding that we were able to secure from Theater Emory to be able to involve undergraduates in the production. And we didn't have a stable of Yiddish fluent undergraduates, so we knew that if we could um, have the students as narrators, that that would give them a really substantial role. And we were able, one of the ways that Emory was generous, not just Theater Emory, but the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies, is that we were able to create a course to serve as a kind of container and laboratory space for this project. And they allowed me to hire Yankel as a teaching assistant so we could work with students week after week and bring them into the process. And the course was about Yiddish political theater. And the sort of shared final project was Lobzik and storyboards that, that they made, um, conceptualizing scenes. Uh, and it, just briefly, because you mentioned it, you know, the, the different Yiddish dialects that are on display is overwhelmingly just the work of the actors themselves. You know, we had some really sort of eminent Yiddishists and Yiddish performers involved, and 100% um, of whom had, you know, I was directing them, but they all had vastly more knowledge and experience in this than I did. So I just really put my put my faith in those performers, and they all obviously did extraordinary work. So whether it's, you know, Shane's sort of um, theater Yiddish that we hear, or Michal's, like, Litvak doctor, or whatever else, like, those are kind of choices that were being made, you know, I, to the best I could, you know, I was making, and I was working with them in an informed way, but really I put, I put that um, in the hands of those performers, yeah. I know many people here are fluent in Yiddish, or are already students uh, at Evo. Some of you are already teachers at Evo. Um, but if not, come study Yiddish with us. It's just a quick, a quick aside. It's worth it. <laughs> We've got some fantastic See teachers. See what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to open it up to questions to the audience in a moment, so get your thinking cap on about that. But first I want to ask um, just about the music. There was a lot of really interesting different kinds of music, old music, newly composed music. You have the Rosenkismet Mondlin um cover, so I want to, I want to hear about, t talk, talk us about the music. So we wanted a number of different musical idioms. We felt like Klezmer had a lot of currency in, among contemporary American Jews, and so we, we wanted, and we were so fortunate that real luminaries of the Klezmer world agreed to work with us. We also wanted the the sound of, of Yiddish folk music and lullaby. So we were 
also fortunate that Ada had co composed this little lullaby of the pioneers um, based on language that was in Chavar Pavar's text. And then you and Michal Yashinsky just went crazy writing this on track song. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, well, like most, <laughs> like most things, it started off as a joke I was telling myself um, because I, unfortunately for everyone around me, like I grew up with a lot of uh, Alan Sherman and Tom Lehrer and Weird Al Yankovic. And so my first creative impulse is parody, which is, it is what it is. Um, and, and I was really just trying to make myself laugh, honestly. Uh, and I texted Miriam like a rough draft of the lyrics, being like, ain't this cute? Aren't we having sort of fun on the side? And Miriam was like, okay, great. Well, where do you think we'll put it? Sort of in the middle or? <laughs> and so I... I her response was, call the Klesmatics. <laughs> well, pretty much. Yeah, and, and, and I, you know, Michal helped me a lot making sure it was a good Shane Rain Yiddish and, mm -hmm. um, you know, helping me with all of my egregious uh, errors and saying it so beautifully. And yeah, we were very fortunate. Um, Michal introduced me to Lisa Fishman, who, with whom he had performed in Fiddler Off and Dach off Broadway. Um, and I think it was maybe Asia who put me in touch with Lauren, who so generously agreed to put together those incredible backing vocals. Um, and it's kind of become a, a favorite part of it for me. I, I think there's something very special when, like, a sort of silly, jokey idea gets taken very, very seriously. And um, I'm very pleased <laughs> with how it came out. Yeah, it was a really beautiful touch. Okay, are there any questions in the audience? Yeah. I loved all the uh, shorts, but I do have one question, the one with the mayor. He was speaking Yiddish, just a different dialect, I guess. It made it less believable that a mayor in that time period would be speaking Yiddish. And I was wondering why you didn't have him speak English or some other, you know, at that point, you know? It, it's a it's a good observation, right? Because why the mayor wouldn't be speaking English, the principal, I'm sorry, wouldn't be speaking Yiddish, the principal wouldn't be speaking Yiddish. And Nayach, the friend from public school, who's not, in the text, seems not to be Jewish, is also speaking Yiddish. But this, these texts were written for Yiddish-speaking children, um, and they were written in Yiddish. And I, uh, you know, I think, so part of it was just sort of preserving, like, within this idiom, within this sort of framework, like everybody speaks Yiddish because it's being read by people who speak Yiddish. Um, but also we had talked about uh, early on in the process how to distribute, we knew we wanted to use some of the original Yiddish. We knew we wanted to use some of Miriam's like totally beautiful English translation. And part of what we settled on uh, was, you know, English for the narration and Yiddish for the, for the dialogue. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that, that, that makes sense to me still, even though it does certainly produce some of these kind of dissonant moments, yeah. Although I also think that um, the reader, and in this case the viewer, is kind of in on the joke. Like, imagine a world, imagine a New York where the mayor speaks Yiddish and the police all speak Yiddish and the, you know, your African-American bestie from public school also speaks Yiddish. Like, everyone speaks Yiddish on one hand, and on the other hand, there is a lot of English layered into Javier Pavar's prose. There are individual words and there are whole phrases that are delivered. And at one point in the final story of the collection, there's, there's even a, a moment when Betel is trying to communicate at a protest march in Washington, D.C. with another striking worker who's not Jewish, and he uses an expression in Yiddish, and the other guy is totally puzzled. And it's sort of this moment in the text, like, wait a minute, this has never come up before? So I think it's also, you know, something that we're supposed to really enjoy, that incongruity. So I, I noticed that each of the short vignettes starts with like a, a zoom in where you guys are like doing puppetry and then you enter the world and it doesn't leave. How did you arrive at that creative decision? 
Um, this was, thank you. This is definitely something that sort of organically came about as we were working. Um, and honestly, I don't recall the moment where we decided on it. It was probably um, our, our cinematographer, uh, Milton Cordero's idea, I think. I imagine he, he presented to me and I was like, you're a genius. Let's do it every time. Um, well, don't forget we had been talking about Brecht in the seminar. This is right? true. And these distant things. So. Bit of a Verfremdums effect, epic theater moment, right? Where we're reminding everyone, okay, yes, get absorbed into the character in the circumstance, but don't forget you're watching a show and it has something to teach you, right? Like these stories are, um, I think, generously didactic, right? And so I think in keeping with that, reminding everyone this is a constructive narrative and it's here for a reason. Um, also in a sort of, less exciting but very practical sense. Um, a lot of people look at this and go, what a nice cartoon you've made. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love cartoons. But I think it's uh, it was important to me personally that it be very clear, like, this is all being created live with people's hands, with real physical objects. Um, and I think there's something really sweet about getting a little glimpse of that reality before we like immerse ourselves in the in the puppet world. So I, I loved it also. Um, and one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that so many of the, the themes seem so dark for, for a story that you would read to a child. You know, there's, there's the depression and there's hunger and there's the little girl who almost dies of illness and there's like the dog who almost gets killed. But I, I thought it was interesting that in the end, the, the people who sort of save the day in the last story are still the parents, right? It's like the mothers and the father who's the firefighter. And I was curious a little bit about that kind of shift back and forth between like the sort of these dark themes that seem almost unusual for, for, for these kinds of stories, but then like sort of in the end kind of coming back to a, a world that seems more familiar to us where the parents are the ones who are able to make it right. Um, and is that something that you see in some of the other stories? Was that something that you grappled with when you were making the this movie? Sure, uh, so I'll start start off on that one. Um, I tend to look at these stories by Javer Paver alongside other Yiddish communist children's literature that was being produced at the same time in the Soviet Union. And this is a this is a chapter in the, I have two books coming out next fall. One of them is the full translation of Lobzik that will be out with Sunni Press. But the other one is, <laughs> <laughs> yes, get excited. <laughs> um, that'll be September of 2024. Mirza Shem. And Haver um, Paver would not have added Mirza uh, Shem. And the other is a critical study where, you know, I, I, look, I look at a lot of different things, but there's this one chapter on the communist children's literature. And there's this unusually neat inversion whereby in the Soviet Yiddish children's literature, the parents are all absent, defective, incompetent, and the state, particularly in the form of Papa Stalin, is the real protector and caregiver. And in the American communist children's literature, even though there is like maybe a 90 or 95 percent agreement about everything else, there is this precise inversion where um, if in the Soviet Union the state is your real family, in America your family is like this well-functioning little democratic state. And that's very much what we see in these stories by Javer Paver, where I know it looks dark next to contemporaneous American children's literature, but compared to the Yiddish children's literature of the USSR, this world is light, bright, and sparkling. Your parents have your back. Your, the, your parents are capable people, even when times are bad and they can't provide well for you as they would wish to. They are still capable of protecting and insulating the children of the family. We have time for one final question. The gentleman up here. Thanks, it was great. Uh, what, 
two quick two questions. One is, it, where can people see this if we want to share it with other people? And then the other is, uh, what's the relation between the artwork and the original? Is is the artwork from the 30s or sort of inspired by it? I, I, maybe you said it and I, I just missed it. So about point number one, unfortunately, this is being held very closely by Theater Emory. It is their intellectual property. We're very grateful for the support from them in making it, but we don't have the freedom. It, it had two two-week streaming runs, and it reached about... 5,000 people, and we think that there are probably, I don't know, 25,000 people in the world who want to see it. Um, at and least. At, at least, right. And as of right now, we don't really have a way. That the agreement that we have in place that we've negotiated is that it can be shown at festivals and cultural institutions. So we're trying to, you know, we've entered it in a number of festivals and had it rejected, and actually word has gotten back to us anecdotally that oh, they loved it, but it's just a little radical. So that, <laughs> that, that's a bit of an obstacle that we haven't figured out how to surmount. Um, so that being said, if you would like to see Lobzik Tales of a Clever Pup or share it with your friends and loved ones, pitch a local university or cultural institution on doing a screening, and uh, if we can get there, we will. Um, in regards to the, the second question, um, so all of the art that you see in the film itself is brand new original created by our absolutely unbelievable, brilliant workhorse of a designer and fabricator, Ryan Bradburn, who designed, built, painted nearly 200 discrete individual puppets uh, for this film. Unbelievable guy. Um, and scenery by Marsha. And scenery by Marsha Cohen. Um, but we provided, so when we were in like early like pre-storyboarding meetings, we provided uh, Ryan with the original illustrations by Lou Bunin, who, whole different conversation, but really, really fascinating uh, guy, did the first ever uh, film version of uh, Alice in Wonderland, but then he got squashed by the Disney people because they were about to do theirs. That's another conversation. Um, but we, we provided those as a point of inspiration. And then we also shared um, some work from uh, Yossel Cutler and Zuni Maud, who are, I think, probably, okay. yeah, uh, best known uh, maybe for their Yiddish puppet company, Modicut, but they were also both in incredibly prolific uh, illustrators and like political cartoonists and stuff and really, really exemplify like the cool modernist, like wacky radical illustration styles of this moment in this time and place. And we kind of said, here are these three artists, I don't know, triangulate between the three of them for inspiration and then, you know, follow your, your own style. And I, I was thrilled with what he came up with. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to be able to say that our fabricator, Ryan Bradburn, is doing um, new illustrations for the full translation that will be out in September. Um, so we'll have the originals by Lou Boonin, and we'll have new ones by Ryan Bradburn. You heard it here for, first, folks. Me too. Um, well, thank you both so much. It's wonderful to, to share this with the community here. Yeah. And congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks so much to Evo for hosting us. All right. Take care, everyone. See you again soon.